Alright, thanks everybody for coming, everybody for coming. Um, I'm Taylor Riche, I'm the product owner for the NHG Applications and Libraries team as well as the Built Up Debugging team. Um, and today I am talking about, basically doing an in-depth look about some of the principles we use to design how libraries and built EACs work in LabVIEW and NHG. Um, obviously this is not the title that is on the, the agenda, I think this title is just more funny, or funnier, so I went with that one. It also allows me to make this really nerdy animation. So, okay. What were the reasons that there are? Um, there are four major design principles. Well, actually, before we get started, if you have questions, please interrupt me. We have John has a mic going around. We can get you with a mic. Um, we'll also have time for questions at the end. The presentation only goes about 30 minutes. So, okay. So there are four major design principles that we use when we were coming up with libraries and applications in an XG. Because at the end of the day, we wanted libraries and applications to feel more natural than they do in LabVIEW. We want it to feel less bolted on and more holistically part of the product. Um, so the four principles are that components are everything. Right? This is your main organizational tool. This, if you are creating any app that isn't just taking basically one or two measurements, you should be using components to organize your code to create applications, things of that nature. The second one is the notion of one library type per target. Um, in in LabVIEW, you can have what's called like a source library or just an lib, and you can have an lblibp or ppl. Those can live in the same together, and weird logical things happen when that happens. So we wanted to basically restrict our desktop. You only have binary libraries or the equivalent of lblibps and encourage it. And on the other targets, you just use source library. Now the folder structure has changed, and I'll go into details about that. And at the end of the day, this is one of the more controversial points, that all plugins must be compiled. When I talk about plugins, I mean you have a lot of the application, and then you're dynamically loading the eyes at runtime that you do not know about once you compile it to your application. Um, in LabVIEW, you can just have a VI on disk and load it. We, and actually are not allowing that, we have to actually create one of these GLLs, one of these binary libraries out of that VI first. Now we're going to go into details about why we make this. The first, a demo. And it's anyway, Jeff goes really quickly, so I'm going to try to keep up. So over on the left, this is our files pane in NXG. You see you have a bunch of components. Those components also match the structure on the disk. We keep up with that for you, right? So we keep do that matching for you. If you build it, you build your EXE, but you also build these binary libraries. So as, as opposed to, to the flat view, you don't have separate projects for the PPL. So all in there, there's libraries, and when you build them, they create the right thing. If I built a web app, I just build one model with the executable. That's the output files, there's my EXC on the disk, I can run it, it'll launch, I can do things, and I can exit. Uh, and even if I hit the X, I wrote my app correctly as an event structure, so I would just look on the right now. Um, and this is actually the key message handler example that ships with the product along with continuous measurement, uh, finite measurement, a couple of examples like that. We have componentized all of those now. So when you start with one of those templates, you start with libraries, you start with applications. So like I said, that to us is the fundamental way you should organize your code, right? Like components are everything. And when I talk about this to people, I usually get this look, like why do I have to use components, right? Like, I don't know what I'm doing, why do I need to use all this, this stuff? So, I like to talk about these concepts along a spectrum. So on the left, you have just plain loose files, right? All your files are in one spot. This is great if you're taking like a single measurement or something like that, like, you don't need a lot of fanciness, you just have your VIs, you know, and you do what you want. But, you maybe use naming conventions, you just give the VIs to someone else, everything works, that's fine. But as we start to scale up our application, usually we need a little more organization. So maybe we use multiple folders, right? Here we can have the folders have meaning, so you can have a folder that's like, you know, hardware devices, you can have a folder that's types, but those things have meaning just to you, right? So even though you're putting associated files in the same folders, the IDE, LabVIEW, does not know anything about that those files are related, and really can't help you do anything in that regard. At the far end, we have components. This is libraries applications in NXG. So you put related code in components. We know about components. We can help you refactor that code around, update all of your call, locate, help you update all of your instances when you move something or you rename it. Um, the code becomes more distributable. You can distribute those components independently. 
and consumable. It's easy to basically use one of those components as a, you know, as a customer. And the organization becomes more scalable. Because the IDE knows about components and knows about that as a technique of organization, we can help you to create more and more of these things and to refactor across. But people also get kind of worried when I start talking about the file structure and moving files around and all that. And I'm here to say, don't worry, your files are OK. We sync the project and the disk. So if you saw that animated shift in the beginning, the file structure and the thing you see in the project look exactly the same. We don't expect you just to have to do all that under the covers. Like, we do all that for you. We really are focusing the workflow on staying in the editor, staying in the IDE. And as you refactor your files, as you rename them, as you move them from one component to the other, we are keeping up with the stuff on disk. So here's an example of that. I create a new library, call it Foo, and after I save, there is, you see Foo pop up on the right. If I create a new VI inside of Foo, we'll see the VI get created in the right folder. I can create a new namespace, and then add a VI to it, because blank namespaces don't do anything. You can see me realizing this as I'm building the animation. Um, and there's my namespace with the VI in it, and if I rename that VI, You'll see that that rename happens on this, and also you'll see all the usages of that VI get automatically updated. Yes. You apply, like, you apply those changes into like source control as well. Oh yeah, like doing an SVN rename. Um, we don't currently automatically do them in SVN, right? So we're not we're not sort of mirroring as we're not mirroring um, the actions of the editor with uh, SCC like source code control commands. We generally have built this with the notion that. Um, sort of control systems like Git are becoming more and more popular. I know that's not everybody yet. Those um, those systems do deal much better with renames and moves than say things like SVN did or back in the day CBS did. Um, so we are designing around that more because we see that proliferating at a pretty rapid pace across people. So. We do, we do understand that there will be some difficulties with SVN. We do have an SVN plugin that uh, we ship to help with MHD, um, but we are not constantly issuing SVN commands like we were in these renames. The need to put things in a Git repository is the 100% reason why I have Windows Explorer open all the time when I'm developing images. Because the renames and stuff are not transparent. In my view, you've got to go do that manually, of course. If you, you take that load off, then yeah, I, I would agree with you. But and otherwise, otherwise, Windows Explorer is staying open because that's the only way I can keep the Git stuff straight. So what you, I rename a file, you yeah. I'm going to remember that I've already added it, and if I, you know, it's going to get, it's going to have an issue when I go to commit. The easier thing to do for me is just to deal with it right at the moment. So you're just issuing a git command immediately when you've, after you've done the I'll literally do the git rename and stuff so that I don't have to deal with git getting, I, I've literally had git get out of sync with between right. computers because I was like renaming files on one, and, you know, you be careful. So, no, we, we do understand that, file, that source code control um, is something we need to um, think about how exactly we, we are at the net. Generally this pattern from, and I would, I would, I would wish the was here because she could basically comment on that or she's the PO that focuses more on those sorts of things. Sure. Um, she'll be here this, on she'll be on Friday. This file usage pattern, from what we understand, or from what I understand, from what I, my conversations with her, fits much better with Git than the previous version I had of it, right? And so that's what we're trying to get towards. But we do assume most people are going to get there. Okay. Very good question. Any other? Okay. So a couple other things, like I said, the component layout and the file system layout are mirrored. We keep, we keep that up to date as you rename things, we're renaming on the file system. Um, this is a well-accepted thing in a lot of languages. This is not something new we invented. Um, and we take, care of, we take care of the refactoring for you as you move things around between components as you do refactoring. We're updating all the usages for you. Or we're, updating, you know, we're making sure your code still works, that kind of thing. Namespacing, we introduced the concept of namespacing. Namespacing allows you a way to basically address the fully qualified name of your APIs independent of the file organization. So it's sort of a different logical layer upon the organization about the names of things. So some companies, for example, have very strict namespacing rules about their code. 
This allows you to have it in there. With this other one, you actually have to refer to a VI, you use the fully qualified name. It's not necessarily based on the component name, it's based on the namespace. The namespace, by default, is the component name. So if you're just okay with the way your components are named, great. But if you have some other extra rules or organization you want to do with your naming, you can use namespaces to do that. Okay, so one library type to rule them all, as the title of the, the, the uh, talk is. So in LabVIEW, there, you can have, on a given target, and in your app, you can have libraries that compile differently. So we have two different library types, and that leads to a lot of scary questions. And these two clowns also lead to a lot of scary questions. <laughs> and so that's why I picked this image, because this is horrified me. And so what are those questions, right? And those questions are, which state am I going to get? So let's say you have like a lot, you know, a functional global, and if there's a situation where you can actually get two copies of that global, but we don't tell you about that. That's dangerous. And there's also, where, why are my types different? You can have, say, an LD class, like a LD class, that ends up looking exactly the same, but when you actually go to runtime, those things conflict. They're not the same type. So how do we get in this code? So the picture on the left is basically what you're going to experience in NXG on the desktop which is you have an app, it builds into an app, you have three libraries, they each build into their own separate artifact. So you have nice four separate binary things that get created. At the bottom, the C library had a G type, which is the NXG equivalent of a library class, and a VI that say has some state in it. So right now everything uses the same state of type, right? There's only one copy of that GVI and there's only one copy of that class. Everything is fine. In LabVIEW, you could get in a situation where you told LabVIEW that you wanted C to compile as like a source library, just an LB lib. And what that meant is that anyone who used C, say in this example, A and B, would actually make a copy of that code and compile it into their binary artifact. Right? So these, let's say, in LabVIEW would be LB libps. And then the app would just use those two LB libps. The problem now is we've effectively made copies of that type and that VI. So your code thinks it's just using foo.gtype, but really it's using foo and foo something else that gtype at the runtime, and now they can flip. And we've also made separate copies of that state that lived in there. Some people actually think this is a feature. I do not. I think that it's playing with fire. I think it's very dangerous. I think basically it's, it's allowing for logical constructs to be defined by organizational tools, which is a weird thing, and sort of not having a good separation of concerns. So we are not doing this, we are doing this model. Now on some targets, say like the web target or FPGA, everything is a source library. Everything gets sucked up into that final, that final binary artifact. The key thing to remember here in XG is that any given target does it all one way or all the other way, and we know which is the right way. So your libraries just work. You don't have to set, oh, this is a source library, this is a GLL. It just does the right thing for that target. Um, the other thing is that basically in the editor, we want the editor behavior and the build TXC behavior to be separate. The editor does not know about this weird blended library type thing, even in LabVIEW. So in LabVIEW and XG, we always want the editor and the um, TXC to work the same. So we didn't want to introduce this very strange concept back into the editor that would be very expensive for what we thought was very marginal benefit. The other thing to note is that having the one library type from an implementation perspective, not only do we feel that it, it's much, a much easier concept for people to, to understand and to build better code, but it's much easier for us to build. The library, regardless of what target you're on, whether it be desktop, web, FPGA, or real time, the library works the same in the editor. It just it has the same type of rules, compile rules, errors, that kind of thing. It always works the same. The only difference is actually how we on the back end deal with it. So for example, on the desktop we build GLLs, on the other targets we build source. We do, and it is on the backlog, we do eventually want to allow GLOs on real time. Um, so you could have like separate binaries on real time. That would allow you to do patching and things of that, you know, things of that, plugins, things of that nature on the real time targets. But for right now, real time is source only, you end up with one real time VXC. So getting to the output folder. Yes, the, output, the extra folders are necessary. So when you build an EXE, you basically, this is what you get. You get, a, you get your EXE over here in a folder, and you get any GLLs you use end up in their own folders next to that EXE folder. 
And so the question we get a lot of times is, why don't you just put it all in the same spot? Like, why, why don't, why, this seems unnecessary. Well, there's a couple reasons. Um, one of them is support file isolation. That's actually the really straightforward one. If you're using images or other some sort of non-lab you code files that you want to go along with your component or your app, then we want those to stay nice and separate. If you had a bunch of different libraries from a bunch of other people that some of those support files have the same names, if we all put it in one spot, whoop, they go collide, and now you don't know what's going on, and your app doesn't work right. So having the separate folders keeps us nice and isolated. Um, the plugin installation there, I'll get to in a second, but the first one is the single lookup for dependencies. Well, I've had some interesting rules about where it found dependencies for things. And it was kind of complicated, it was very powerful, but it was very complicated. We tried to, we want to simplify that, because not only does it make our implementation a lot more cleaner and a lot easier to keep correct, it, it's a lot easier on you all to understand, that, hey, what am I actually going to load as a dependency? So anything, you know, anytime I load this, if this thing has dependencies, I just know they're all next door. If I load the EXE, all these dependencies are just up one and next door. So it makes a very easy, straightforward way to understand dependencies. For right now with plugins, the first release of plugins, that plugins are not out yet, they will, we're working on that now. The way that will work is basically, I compile, say B is my plugin library, I compile B, I just copy all of that over here to where my app is, and I can then dynamically load that thing. That obviously is not good enough. We need a solution for having your plugins be in some arbitrary location on disk, not necessarily next to the application. We are currently working on figuring that out, that it's hard. Uh, to do well, <laughs> um, and so we are trying to answer some key questions. Because what we don't want to introduce, if I go back to my one library problem, we don't want to introduce that same problem with plugins um, once we allow for arbitrary file locations. But we understand that it is absolutely a requirement, and we have to figure that out, and we're working on it. Okay, the last design principle is plugins being compiled. This one I know is a little bit controversial. Um, obviously, it's, it's very convenient just to drop a bunch of VIs in a folder and then load them at one time. Um, there are some problems with that. I think people like often look at that a little rosier than it probably is. Cross-linking is one of the issues with that, right? When at one point the VI is loading something else, you put some other thing in there, now the names kind of match and you end up loading a different set of dependencies. When it's compiled, we don't the link. Like we understand the linking is done at the compile time, so we understand much better what where the dependencies are, especially with the output structure, we can do that. Um, it allows for the same behavior, the editor and the exe now. Everything works the same in terms of linking and dependency lookup. Um, and obviously the GBI files don't have binary contents in them, and so we need to get that binary content from somewhere. And so by compiling them, doing the linking and doing that dependency check. Beforehand, it allows for a much cleaner, much more, um, which we feel much easier workflow for you all to actually get stuff out the door. Even though it's a slight trade off on, there's one extra step basically that your plugin author has to do. We feel that extra step is worth it um, to, for the overall success. So, when is this stuff available? Proponents are here now. They're in, they've been in there since LiveView and XG2.1. Again, this should be your main organizational tool when you're writing code in LiveView and XG. Um, GLLs are coming soon, LiveUNXG 4.0 releases imminently. Um, that is where when you build an EXE that has libraries, those on the desktop, those things will compile to GLLs. Can't really do anything with them in 4.0, but we wanted to get the concept out there, we wanted to get the technology out there for you all to use. As we move forward, we'll do things where we can replace those GLLs independently as patching. We'll also introduce plugins. That's us a little bit further out, but that's what we're working on literally right now. All right, I'm going to pause any questions up to this point. Um, can you explain the difference between a component and a GLL? Are those uh, yeah, so I use the word component and library and application very interchangeably. The app, basically, application libraries are types of components, mm -hmm. and GLLs are the binary version of a library component. So when I actually compile the library, I get it one single GLL out. Uh -huh. I think we were technically saying it stands for G-loadable library. It's really just kind of punny off of DLL, but you know, whatever. Right. Um, so, but it is the binary artifact that is created from the library. So a component, so component and library 
basically mean the same thing? Or component is like a library is a component, but a component is not a library? Or a yeah, library is a type of components. There are okay. two types of components, libraries and applications. Right. Applications are your top level component that turns into an EXE. Mm -hmm. Libraries are used for reusable code. Okay. Right. The file extension is the same. The file extension for all of them is the same. It's not a GCOM. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Can GLLs be unloaded from memory? Not currently, no. Just, can you ask, can we ask why you're asking that question? <laughs> it's a distinction currently between loading a Lambda class from disk and loading a VI using OpenVI. You can use the closed VI and it will unload from memory. So you, oh, okay, sorry. Currently, no, you can't because they're all loaded statically. Once we introduce plugins, you will have the closed component reference. That's what I was getting at. Okay, yeah, that's it. So you will, yes, you will do that. Thanks. Yeah, I have to, these questions are always interesting because it's like, what's exactly the product now we are currently working on? And what, so it's like, it's always interesting to be, to yeah, if you dynamically load a component, you will be able to dynamically close it. Okay, so let's go through a quick demo of kind of using libraries, using components, building up a little application. So I want to build a little calculator. So I start with a very basic calculator, which is just an adder. But then, yes, I, like I said, I'm very big into like agile development. So my first thing I can do that has value is create an adder. And then I said, well, that's not particularly useful, but I'm going to start there anyway. So first thing I do, the first thing I always do when I'm creating an NXG application is I start with new application. Um, this should be your starting point. This is the thing that turns into an EXE. Even if you're not creating an EXE, you're just organizing your code in a reusable way, I would suggest to start here, right? Um, so I create my application, but I, you know, I want to add a, another little slice of, user fu of usable functionality. So I put my add into a sub-VI, I put a little case structure around it, and now I have this you know, type that comes in that has basically the inputs and what operation I want to do. So I could have add, I could have subtract, and so you can see over here, I've created some track. I've pulled out that control on the front panel into a G type, and which is our type deaths or CTLs in LabVIEW. And I have dialed my code. So now what I want to do, I want to, where's the image? There it is, okay. I want to create a new library and put my computational code in that library. So now I have this computation.gcon. Because if you think about it, add and subtract, well, I may actually want to use those in some other thing I'm working on. So those are a nice foundational, just pure computational library that's a reuse library. So let me go ahead and move that in there. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and create a new namespace because I'm going to make that operator, that enum, into a type as well. So now I have these two custom types I've built. So I'm going to create a namespace in my main app, uh, my main component, my application component, to have to hold those two types. And this is just for organizational purposes. This is just for me to keep my code nice and clean and tidy. So now I actually pull out that picker logic from the, you know, I put that in the sub-DI because maybe I want to use some other construct at some point. There it is. And I go ahead and pull out another you know, component called picker logic and put my picker in there. But really, that's the only thing that needs to know about that enum. So I go ahead and just pull that enum down lower into that component so there's less things depend on it. And again, you know, there's my enum. I have a type namespace there. So what I'm trying to show here, that's this is the demo. What I'm trying to show here is that the componentization of your app, of your project you're working on, should never be static, right? And something you should be refactoring and always saying, hey, does this make the most sense for these files to be next to each other? And maybe I add some other stuff and say, actually, now this thing should be over here with this thing. Because there's a, there's a bunch of good best practices for componentization. Uh, I think you can look at my NIW presentation on this or go through all those. But you can also read a book called Clean Architecture by Robert C. Martin or Uncle Bob, where he has a whole structure, a whole set of chapters on componentization. It's very applicable to not only like C plus C sharp people, but also like G developers. It's just great rules for how to organize your code in meaningful ways. It's an easy read, it doesn't take very long, but it really sort of codified these principles about how you should think about what code should go together. And so it should be a constant process of you answering, is this the best way my code could be organized? And with our refactoring tools, we hope that we make it easy for you to go through that refactoring exercise on, on, you know, on a repeated basis. 
So at the end of the day, I have my little calculator app here. I can build it. You know, I go ahead and build it. You can see I build my two libraries into GLLs. I have my EXE, and everything's fine. Okay. So yes. Just trying to get caught up. So you talked about. So in this particular application, your GLL is in a folder with your application, your computation. Uh, that a folder structure on the storage device. Your receiver. Right. So if you look, if you were to look on disk, you would have basically a folder with my project in it, and then there would be three subfolders: a my app, a computation, and a paper logic folder. So if a reusable code, now that's reusable. Uh, what does the other app do? Copy the source code because that's ugly. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. so, okay. So if you want to actually, if you're actually building a library as a reuse library, right? So let's say I say, you know what? Computation is great. I had a bunch of stuff to it. I don't want to ship that as a product. What we would recommend you do is you pull that out into its own project. And you actually build that GLL as a standalone thing, and we can build basically like a package or like a MI package around that to actually go or a package installer to install that as an add-on. And so at that point, whoever installs that thing in their palette, they'll see basically an entry for your like all the things that you're exporting out of Computation. So now someone else can use that statically as opposed to having to pull that code in and copy it. Um, our eventual usage model is basically if it's something you really think a lot of people are going to use, you do that avenue. If it's something you're just giving to the person next to you, you can either just give them the source code or you can even just eventually give them the GLL and pull that GLL directly into your project, that binary. And then when is eventually going to be next to you five? Not in HG5. In HG5 will not have that the ability to consume GLLs like that. That'll be after in HG5. Thank you. So. Okay. So if you had or are interested in helping with how to shape how plugins work, like I talked about that notion of how do we do plugins at an arbitrary file location. Um, and then debugging, right? How do you attach to a already running EXE and what are the expectations you have of that debugging experience? I would love to talk to you. So please come talk to me or email me. That's my email address. You can come talk to me the rest of the week. I'll be here. Um, we are setting up basically a series of interviews that we're going to do where we're going to go in more detail into what your use cases are, what your workflows are, what you're, you know, what you're trying to do, and use that to basically influence our design for these things moving forward. So our, my teams are currently thinking about these concepts and we want to have y'all's input like directly drive where we go and how we solve these two problems. So if you're interested in this, come talk to me and we can get you the details about how they're basically be involved in that after the sale is over. And that's it. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, the GLLs would be some kind of integrated way to be able to put them and use the PMI package manager to kind of deploy them? Yeah. As a downloadable component from the IDE or something? Yeah, so basically this doesn't work in uh, 4.0 because in 4.0 we're not letting you to build GLLs independently. They're just as part of an app. But once we actually allow for independent GLLs, that is, you could right click, you should be able to right click on that component in the left side. There's an option there that says create the distribution installer from this thing. It instantly creates the document that allows you to do that. You push one other button and you get a, uh, either a package or a package installer that can allow you to install that thing. And that package, when it's deployed, when it's being installed on another computer, does it go to a, like a central location or does it go to a project? Yeah. Like, is it project based or is it? Right now it is NXG based um, per, in, for, per major version of NXG. Um, Sumeda is the PO who is actually currently kind of getting that, like asking lots of people about that exact topic. She'll be here on Friday. So track her down if you have opinions on that. Um, whether, whether you prefer per project, whether you prefer per app, or per, you know, even um, like per, whether there's stuff or what the different options are. But talk to Sameda. She would love to get your input on that because her teams are currently trying to figure that out. It, it installs per system. It, it installs per system. choose to pull it in or out of a specific project. Like, yes. Yeah, so, Right, right. It does currently install per version of LabVIEW. It installs in a version like NHG 4.0 add-ons, basically. Um, and then in a project, you can actually say, oh, I don't want to use that add-on if you, for some reason, had a local different copy of it or something like that. 
Um, but generally, it does install per version of the .NET Sheet right now. However, that's what we're trying to figure out if that's the way we want to continue to go moving forward. So you said that GLLs can only be built next to the application? What, just in this first release. So how do I do that? How do I call it GLL from test stand? Ah, test stand. That's a separate question. So there is a special test stand thing. If you, if you have test stand, then you can actually build a standalone GLL out of from an XG to create a test stand out of that and then load that a test stand. So if you have a test stand license, we turn on the super secret test stand thing, and then now GLLs have a build button. Or sorry, like libraries have build buttons on them. If in in 4.0, well, I will explain this. In 4.0, if you open a library, you do not have a build button unless you have test stand installed, and then you have a build button. Because we then think you're trying to run a test step for test stand. Um, in 5.0, all libraries will have build buttons regardless of whether you have test stand or not. So next question is, can we have inheritance across GLLs? Yes. Okay. Inheritance across libraries is completely functional. And whenever we get interfaces in XG, you also have any, you know, inherit like basically interface composition and all that across GLLs as well. That will just we'll, that will obviously have to work um, from the get go. Yep. So, so you may. Uh, okay. <laughs> Good job. Um, so I was curious about the idea of um, whether or not to build uh, kind of like a sub GLL into the GLL to kind of hide. I don't know if it was necessarily hiding it, but basically building it as kind of a standalone monolithic thing versus something that had a dependency on another GLL is one of your early slides. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned something about like not kind of having two different types. And I was wondering, would it, would it keep it external only if that type was um, exposed through kind of the calling interface? And I forget if you had A, B, and C. So for example, if B doesn't actually expose C, it just calls it. Oh, no, so I, I see what you're saying. Um, let me get to that slide. So, so basically, you won't actually ever experience this in NXG. Like, we don't allow this to happen. So okay. NXG will never build C into A or B? It'll always be external? Right. It, on the desktop, it will always look like this. Uh -huh. And then on the other targets, they will all build into one master thing at the top. Okay. At which point, then there's still just one copy of C. The, when, where you run into problems here is that you have A and B building the separate binaries, yeah. sucking in C separately. Yeah, and I, I guess in some, in, in the case where we, you're saying it actually won't allow you to do that. Correct. Right. So in the case where, in NXG, where I have A and B and they both depend on C, what if I have different versions, a different version of A, a different version of B, and they use different versions of C? So A and B each have been built to use different versions of C, and neither A nor B even expose C to the application because they're just used internally yeah. like some reuse library. Um, so I'm imagining that what will happen is, is because of the fact A and B both depend on C, I have to use versions of A and B that both use the same version of C. Yeah. So that is right. So right. Right now we don't have sort of explicit version version requirements on the A and B. So basically what happened was, let's say you, you build A, you change C, and then you build C. When you build both of these, you're going to build that dependency over again as its own GLL because we're going to say, oh, you depend on this. When you go to combine all that, it's going to be a little tricky. Now, if you build your EXE, you're going to build it all at once, and so it works. What if I'm building it with binary? If I'm building it with a binary version of, if you're building it. Yeah, so if you say have, so right now we, if all the stuff that you install, you install a source. So all the add-ons oh, that okay. you install a source. So we rebuild the GLLs, even the VI lib ones or the add-ons. We rebuild them every time you rebuild your EXE. We eventually like are going to get to the point where we allow add-on developers to shift GLLs along the uh, okay. source, or only in, shift GLLs. In, can, the, can the GLL embed its sub GLLs? 
Yeah, or down. <laughs> okay. It's always a defendant trumps the bear, yeah. So I, I guess in my mind, and I, I don't fully kind of understand like kind of all the, the benefits you described of, of keeping C as this external thing that A and B depend on. It just makes me kind of wonder about somebody, like I use a lot of reuse libraries and tools that I build. And I know that I know that it works because I validated it and I build it and I want to distribute it. And I like my customers to depend on one thing, which is me. So that I want to hide and abstract everything that went into how I would like how I tick. Mm -hmm. I want my own copy of, of C because nobody needs to know I'm even using C. However, now that people are using me, they essentially inherit my, the depend, all of my dependencies on all of my subcomponents. And if they're using any other libraries from anybody else in the world that happens to have used the same library as me, now they have to make sure that they're using versions of me and them that both use the same version. And then if I start using lots of different components, that problem just won't play as Now when you, install, so I'll say when you install your application, we do it siloed. So we, there is not some sort of like local spot where we are, um, like if you install your app, we install your app and all the dependencies that are necessary into one spot. And we only load from that local area of those dependencies. And I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking all kind of within what, either within one application context or I'm thinking in particular with like LabVIEW plugins. So if I build a GLL, which is a yeah. LabVIEW plugin, most likely I'm going to be using components developed by other developers. Yes. And that, so that brought, that's the problem I was talking about, like having to solve the plugin issue to not duplicate this problem again. That's exactly what I'm talking about. But like, I wanted to build it in, I think. Right. So I think what we. I, I want my component, my, my, I want my plugin to have its own namespace and whatever versions of DLLs that I ship with mine, I want them to be encapsulated and hidden inside of my component's namespace. So we have talked about basically allowing for applications to um, be monolithic. Basically, at some point in time, you have to say everything in this application is going to be monolithic or it's not. Like, you can't mix monolithic and, like, GLLs, right? it, It's not clear to me what, we're, what we mean when we say an, an application in this instance. The right. EXD, the thing that's actually running. The okay. Thing that the user actually no, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. So, at the end of the day, if, if we allow both the, the source behavior and the GLL behavior, like, I think your use case is very interesting. I want to talk to you. I want to learn more about this. Um, most of the time, people are going to basically like hurt themselves with that, right? And so, I think we we have gone to this. We've, we've leaned on the side of being sort of one having the same behavior as the editor, and two not having this like secret duplication of things that people don't know about because that's very dangerous, right? I think what you're, you're saying is an interesting use case where it's like, hey, I want to kind of hide what's going on underneath the covers. So anything that I depend on, I'm somehow like protecting and then yeah. everyone knows about. So, so if I create a component, I say I'm using these components and when I distribute it, I want these internalized so that nobody knows about my dependency on these components and they're all within my namespace. And that's an interesting thing too, because that gets into like redistribution rights of like stuff and, and everything as well. So I, I would like to talk to you more in detail about that. I don't think we're going to solve that. Just like I don't want to try to mm. solve that on the fly here. But, okay. Yeah. Um, it is an interesting use case, and I want to learn more about it to make sure we are taking that into account moving forward. So. Yeah. So I just wanted to go back to this example and just ask if. Uh, would it be possible that if A depends on C version one and B depends on C version two, would it be possible to load like to have uh, two installs of C? So the way that would currently work is when you build the app, you're going to build everything, right? So there, it doesn't matter. There's only going to be one version of C installed on the system, and A and B are both going to depend on that because we're re going to rebuild A, B, and C all at the same time. Right, and we're going to copy. We're going to silo that app. So we're going to copy all the dependencies of that app into one spot. So when I run A, and, or sorry, when I run app, it has all of its dependent GLLs there in one spot. So A and B don't depend on different versions of the GLL. Like because you're using the source of the right, because it's all source. You yeah. can't have two different versions of the 
source in your project. Right. Unless you change the name. So now when we get to the right. Yeah, exactly. So we get to the point where we're actually allowing you to depend on GLO directly, right? And you pull in C GLO C twice into your project. That will be interesting, right? And if it's different versions, it's, it's, so it's not technically the same. It may have different versions of API. How we deal with that, we have to figure out. I think I think it's the case. I think it's the case where when, if I can call GLLs. And I basically I say I want to call a GLL and it's compiled, or I want to call B GLL, mm -hmm. and then those two are say, oh well, we use C. And as a developer, I'm like, well, I didn't ask for C, I asked for A and B. Right. And so I'm hoping. So ideally, Pack and I Package Manager deals with those dependencies for you. So what we are not going to do is reinvent Package Manager dependency checking. Well, and, right? and so would would would. Would the GLL scheme support something like having two different versions of C GLL installed concurrently? So that A could have its version and B could have its version? We, have, we are currently not supporting that, and we have not put a ton of instant. Like, basically, though, the strategy we took was if you were manually pulling GLLs in, mm -hmm. then the dependency checking is sort of on you. Like in terms of versioning and all that kind of stuff. Well, ideal the system is is basically if I'm going to actually code against GLOs directly, I should be installing those things as add-ons and let by like, letting package manager do its like lib solve to make sure I have all the right versions of everything. When when do we eventually when we eventually install um, that allow for forward compatible yep. GLOs, then I could see a situation where I build. I, I'm building an add-on, I'm depending on, say, OpenG, and I'm using an older version of OpenG, and then I'm going to ship my add-on to somebody else. They would then, we would have to support either side-by-side yeah, yeah. -side versions of OpenG, if right. they then wanted to use OpenG, yeah. right? Then We're going to have to deal with, I think, package manager, there's a known thing in package manager where we don't deal well with like multiple versions of the same thing on the system at the same time. So that's what we, we need to deal with that somehow. Um, and like I said, we have not yet baked in the cases where you're actually depending, in a project, you're depending on multiple versions of an add-on. We do not currently support that. And so I think that's basically getting down to what you're, you have this thing you've downloaded and installed that you do not control, and you have multiple versions of it that you are depending upon. How do you basically make sure that that all works out? And we have not yet answered those questions. I was just going to comment that if you build subsystems, that are each running on their own computer and you have a calibration and you have a reporting and you have a test executive. What these folks are describing is not at all unusual. Oh, I know. Yeah. It's it very, very common that you would have the executables built by different people at yeah. different times, but using common libraries that are different versions. Yeah. yeah, we run into this a lot, even if we're not in the business of writing software for others, even if we're just building yeah. our systems for ourselves. Yeah, and this, I would, is a, this is an extremely common requirement. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, well, I want to make it very clear. We are not. We are in no way saying that we have solved all the problems with libraries and dependencies right now. The approach we're taking with NXG is getting out like a little bit of functionality as frequently as we can, and eventually getting up to a system where it does meet all the requirements. But we're using specific workflows to basically say, okay, we're going to get this to actually work really well. We're going to ship that, and then we're going to do this next one. Then we're going to do this next one. Right. So we're not. You know, ideally we would say, oh, we've solved all these problems, and so we got it out there, and it's worked perfectly. It's like we want to get stuff out the door more quickly, even if when we do that, it's not necessarily like fully solving all the problems, but it solves some problems, right? For some people who just have those problems, it's great. And then the next time we'll solve one more problem, and two more problems, and stuff like that. So I, I completely, this is really interesting stuff, and like I really want to dig into this more because this is how we're going to basically have to make sure as we continue to push more functionality into it, we are solving these problems and we do have solutions to these types of multiple dependency issues because they're obviously a real thing and they're a big deal. And so we want to make sure that we capture that in, in our functionality. But this is just kind of a tour of where we are currently. Like, if, you, if I go back to my can I please talk to you later slide, that's exactly the kind of stuff that we want to like talk about because we want to make sure we have these requirements well understood. So as we continue to make this more advanced, we are actually are starting to solve these problems. That's not that 
Any other questions? All right. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Good discussion.